welcome to today's Rohan webinar. So today we are very happy to have Professor Eric Bronofson from Stanford University to talk about the productivity paradox. So Professor Eric Bronofson is a Jerry Young and Akiko Yamazaki professor and senior fellow at Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI and also the director of Stanford Digital Economy Lab. He's also Ralph Landau Senior Fellow at Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, Professor by Courtesy at Stanford GSB and Department of Economics. And he's also a research associate at the MBER. In his research, he studied the effect information technologies on business strategy, productivity and performance, digital commerce and intangible assets. So without further ado, Eric, the floor is yours, please go ahead. Thank you so much, DJ. I, it's really quite a pleasure to be able to uh, share some of my recent research with all of you. In fact, this is joint work with uh, Sunny Tambe, uh, Daniel Rock, and, and Lauren Hitt. And my plan this morning is to mostly discuss a, a paper we have called about digital capital, and which focuses on the intangible assets that are associated with information technology and how they've grown over time and, and how they affect productivity and performance, um, and some new ways of measuring that, both contributions to theory and some empirical uh, data. Um, but I also um, would like to connect that to the broader questions of productivity growth in the economy. So we've had uh, a bit of a productivity slowdown over the past 10 or 15 years, and I can explain or provide an explanation for that um, relating to these exact intangible assets that we'll be discussing. And the good news is by the end, uh, I think I'll give you some um, opt causes for optimism because we have something called the productivity J-curve that suggests that uh, productivity growth will, will start to grow uh, in uh, advanced countries in the, in the very shortly in the coming years. So I'll, I'll be a bit of a pro productivity optimist. Um, I haven't given this exact presentation before, so uh, we'll see how, how long it takes. But my plan, my current plan is to leave a, a good chunk of time towards the end to have broader discussion about intangible assets, information technology, and AI and its effect on the on the economy. So, with that, let me uh, let me dive in and, and uh, into my presentation here. And uh, I hope you can all see my uh, my slides now. Uh, this is the cover slide. So, um, as I mentioned, this is work I've been doing at Stanford um, and before that at MIT. Um, with a, with a group of other scholars, including uh, Sonny Tambay, Lauren Hitt, and Daniel Rock. The first thing I'll say is that um, we should think of information technology and especially artificial intelligence as a kind of general purpose technology or GPT. Uh, Tim Bresnahan and Manuel Trachenberg defined this as technologies that really are the ones that drive most economic growth, like the steam engine or electricity. Um, and they're really fundamental to our living standards and, and really arguably the most important technologies in the world. They have three important characteristics. The first is that they're pervasive. They affect all parts of the economy. The second is that they are, can be improved over time. They don't just um, happen one time. And thirdly, I think this is the most important thing is that they, they spawn some complementary innovations. They drive a virtuous cycle of additional innovation that drives other things. For instance, uh, electricity obviously was was had some wonderful initial applications, but uh, whether it was the light bulb or uh, air conditioning and refrigeration, and ultimately, of course, some computers and electronics, there was a whole set of ongoing innovations that are still happening from electricity and likewise for other general purpose technologies. And if you think about artificial intelligence, it, it ticks all those boxes. Uh, it, there, it's used more and more throughout the economy. I don't think there's any major sector of the economy that isn't significantly affected. We just did a report for, for the AI index, um, where I'm on the steering committee that came out uh, a little over a month ago, where we uh, showed every industry was having uh, significant applications, uh, especially interestingly, biotech. Certainly AI is improving over time. The, the uh, improvements are just... Uh, breathtaking. In fact, that's the essence of, of machine learning. And uh, finally, the, uh, there's so many complementary innovations coming from this. So I think it, it qualifies well as a GPT, a general purpose technology. Um, in fact, you can make the argument that it's the most general of all general purpose technologies. Uh, here's my friend, uh, Demis Hassabis. Uh, he's the CEO and founder of Google DeepMind co-founder. Um, and if you uh, go there and visit the, his offices, they have a very modest goal on the wall there. It, uh, it says that uh, the goal of the company is to solve intelligence. 
and then use that to solve all of the other problems in the world. So uh, I may have to upgrade my, uh, my goals in life uh, to keep up with people like Demis that are having some pretty significant ambitions. But um, I think you, you, you couldn't argue that, that that's not a, uh, a pretty broad general purpose technology. And in a way, we're all lucky to be living in these times when uh, AI is beginning to solve more and more problems in the world. It's a, it's a unique period in human history where you start having machines that can be intelligent. Now, um, what, are the, uh, what are the productivity effects of these general purpose technologies? Well, for the, let me focus on one particular insight, this uh, comment I made earlier that general purpose technologies require complementary intangible capital. Actually, before I, I go into too much further, I should say I'm very happy to be interrupted. If any of you have questions or comments, um, please uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me, especially if you'd like me to clarify anything. Um, in fact, I almost prefer it. Um, so as I mentioned, GPTs um, require complementary inputs, and they're particularly often these are intangible inputs, things like the invention of new business processes or new kinds of skills and capabilities. Uh, new business models. Um, these are all things that uh, are important to get the full benefit of GPTs. Um, but they, the interesting thing about them is that um, they may have uh, negative effects on the way we measure total factor productivity or TFP. Um, because if they increase intangible capital stock, this is often not very well measured. Um, we don't have good measures that the official National accounts generally don't count the value of, say, new business processes. Uh, most accounting systems, um, generally accepted accounting processes, don't count that. Principles don't count that. And so if, if intangibles are difficult to measure, then we will be creating these intangible assets but not counting them. And that's going to uh, leave them out of TFP, leave them out of GDP, and therefore uh, lead to an underestimate of true GDP. Now, in the past few years, we've just had some staggering improvements in AI that um, are making this more and more relevant. Over the past decade, for instance, if you look at vision systems, the progress has been um, absolutely uh, uh, remarkable. Um, here's uh, some uh, images from image. Uh, yes. Uh, can I ask one question? Yeah, I sure. think there are some papers that can document that if we include the intangible capital into the traditional TFP measure, there are still a sizable decline in the productivity mm -hmm. growth. Um, yeah. And how do you kind of relate to that? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I th so it's going to depend a bit on how much you measure. I, I think the intangibles account for part of the shortfall. And uh, I don't think they account for all of it. There are other reasons for there's a shortfall, some having to do with measurement and, and other issues. And um, I think it would be great to have a broader discussion about the broader factors about the, the productivity shortfall over the past decade or so. We wrote a paper called uh, with Chad Severson and Daniel Rock called AI and the Modern Productivity Paradox, where we analyzed four different reasons. Um, I'm not going to go through all those right now in the interest of focusing on the intangible, which is one of the explanations. So this is, this is something that does lead to a shortfall, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's the only important thing that's going on in the economy or the only thing that's driving um, some of the productivity changes, um, but let's uh, let me let me just uh, promise you that I'd be very happy to to discuss uh, the modern productivity paradox in more detail um, uh, uh, after we finish the, the the intangibles part of the talk. And, and uh, I should say um, that I do think the intangibles is the single largest component of the productivity sh shortfall. So it's the it's the main one that I'd like to focus on. But it's it's not the only one, and you know I think over time we'll we'll we'll, we'll learn better what the different components of it are. Um, but back to uh, AI, and, and here's uh, here's some images from ImageNet. Uh, my colleague, my now colleague here at Stanford, uh, Fei Fei Li, uh, put together with her team a uh, set of about 14 million images, each labeled like these are. Uh, there's an antelope there, um, and uh, th there's been a series of contests to see how well machine learning systems can identify the images. And as you can see, a decade ago, they, they weren't all that good, maybe 70% accuracy. In 2012, uh, Jeff Hinton and his team uh, introduced deep learning techniques, uh, deep neural nets. These are neural nets with multi-layers. And uh, when they started doing that, you see there in 2012, there's a dramatic improvement in the accuracy. And now all the systems use deep learning and they are very rapidly 
uh, improving asymptoting, not going above 100%, but getting pretty close to it. And um, it, you, you, you could kind of compare that to how humans are doing on this. Uh, humans are not perfect. Um, you know, to be frank, I don't know. I totally know the difference between an antelope and a gazelle and how I would identify those or some of the other images. So I'm not perfect. And um, in general, humans are maybe about 95% accurate, which, which is less than what the machines are doing on this particular data set. I want to be clear, humans uh, are not worse than machines in all types of image recognition and, and you know, self-driving cars still have a ways to go to match humans in many uh, uh, edge cases. But we do have a, a situation where in more and more applications, the machine is better than the human. And think about it, if you are a, uh, an entrepreneur or a manager and you've got two different ways of solving a problem, one of them using a machine to solve the problem, one of them using a human, and now one of them, one of those methods has become significantly more accurate and cheaper, you're gonna switch over. And there's sort of a, a phase change when you cross that threshold in terms of um, how those particular problems get solved. And uh, certainly whether it's in medical imaging or other applications, more and more uh, tasks are being solved by the machines. And uh, you see that for instance, uh, in these uh, medical images here with the training data, but it's not just that, um, it's really in any application where you have a large amount of data on a set of inputs, call them X, and you need to map them to a set of outputs, call them Y. And as long as you have digital data in both of those categories, or you can create digital data sets for both those categories, it's very likely you'll be able to do a mapping from one to the other using deep learning techniques, using machine learning techniques more broadly. Um, and for that reason, there's a, a gold rush going on right now where companies are, are rushing to find places where they can do that. And I'm sure everyone listening to this talk right now, there are applications in, in your organizations and your colleagues that um, could be done by machine learning techniques that aren't being done that way yet. And uh, over the next few years, we'll see more and more companies and organizations doing that and taking advantage of these technologies. Now, um, as I mentioned, the technology themselves is not enough. You also need to rethink your business processes. And in, in, in related re research, particularly some work I did with uh, Lauren Hitt and David Fatusi, and also with uh, separate work with Adam Saunders, we found that for every dollar of uh, spending or investment, if you'd call it, on IT capital, including hardware and software, there were about nine or 10 additional dollars spent on technological and organizational complements that were necessary to make that technology work. These include business processes and skills, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and so for instance, for enterprise resource planning, ERP systems, typical system cost on the order of about $10 million to implement in a company um, for just the hardware, but uh, it was about another $100 million for the uh, re-engineering of business processes and skill development. And that was a pattern we saw over and over in the different uh, companies that we examined. So um, we call this IT-related intangible capital. We, we, to make it a little shorter, we call it digital capital. These are all the intangibles that are associated with IT, with information technology, hardware, and software. Um, and they can uh, begin to solve some of the puzzles that we've seen over the past couple of decades in IT research. For instance, in, in a work going back, I guess, over 20, 30 years now, um, 25 years, um, we saw that... Um, uh, if you just measured the output elasticity of IT, it was often about three times larger than the input share. And that's a puzzle because uh, if in a competitive equilibrium, you should have the input share and the output share be roughly equal to each other. Um, but one way to explain that is that there were some additional types of investments that weren't being measured, um, specifically these digital capital investments. And then that, that accounted for the additional value being uh, created. I already mentioned that there was about this $10 of market value for every dollar. Um, and uh, I want to be clear that this does not mean that IT is creating a free lunch that is creating all these additional assets or additional output um, just out of thin air. What it means is that when we see IT, um, there we, there's also an unseen amount of intangible assets that's usually associated with it. And the combination of the visible IT and the unseen intangibles is what's adding to the extra output and productivity, what's adding to the extra market value. So it is a, uh, an equilibrium, there's no free lunch there, um, but, uh, but it 
does suggest that there's a, a, some missing values that aren't otherwise being accounted for. So let me address uh, some open questions, and that's what the research is going to focus on. Uh, the first one is these high valuations that we see for IT capital, that the 10 to 1 ratio. Is it a function of uh, companies paying a lot for this, but not having that much capital on the books? Or is the quantity actually very high? And that makes a difference because high quantities is what has that long run impact. If it's just a price effect, um, then that's just uh, rents. Um, secondly, which firms are creating the most digital capital? We can isolate whether it's evenly spread throughout the economy or in certain sectors, or is there a subset of firms that's driving this change? And uh, I, I'll tell you the answer to that in just a minute. And finally, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll tie this to productivity and growth over time. So uh, to preview uh, the results before I get into the, the details of the theory and, uh, and the, and the uh, regressions, um, here's the, the main results. The first one is that we found the digital capital rose quite sharply in the 1990s. Then it fell with the dot-com bubble, um, and then it rose again. And for the past decade, it's been, for more than a decade, it's been rising once again and is now at all-time highs. Um, and if you look at that rise and fall and then rise again of the um, of digital capital, um, we are able to separate that into changes in price and changes in quantity. The initial rise around the dot com in the in the year 2000, 1999, 2000, that was mostly due to higher prices. But the rise since then has mostly been due to higher quantities. Uh, so that's a much more sustainable reason. Um, most of this gain was not evenly spread throughout the economy. In fact, it's more and more concentrated. There's a small subset of firms that's making most of the investments. We call these superstar firms. Less than 10% of the companies in our sample drive more than half of the, the investment. And uh, by the way, these are not just uh, the famous uh, you know, uh, uh, software and internet companies like uh, Google and Facebook and, and Microsoft and Apple. Um, these are, you, if you take all those firms out of the sample, you still get a great deal of concentration in the top 10% of firms. I'll show you the chart later when we get to the data, but, um, but it's, it's companies that are using that capital, not just the ones that are creating it. And again, it's a small subset of firms. And this accounts for this growing inequality in performance of firms as well, because it, it maps to productivity, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, fourthly, we can just decompose this and see different kinds of skills over time. Um, originally, the digital capital was driven by growth of networks. Um, then it was web and database. And now we see most of the growth is associated with data science and artificial intelligence investments. Um, and finally, um, you can compare the contributions of these intangible assets to all the other capital stock. And um, overall, they contribute about twice as much to productivity. Um, and that was most evident in the IT wave. We're actually not seeing it in the AI wave. The artificial intelligence contributions are, are not noticeably larger. Um, and that I will argue is, is not necessarily a mystery. It's because these uh, new technologies tend to take time, five to 10 or more years before they map into productivity. That's what we call the productivity J curve. At first you invest in the intangibles and only later do you harvest them. So we're in the harvesting phase for the first wave, the networks and the traditional IT software, and that's paying off, but we're still in the investment phase for artificial intelligence. So that's not translating into greater productivity right away. Um, the value of a firm's uh, intangible can be revealed into quantities under three assumptions. And these are somewhat strong assumptions. So I think you know, you'd be reasonable to, to wonder how general the, some of these results are, but we're going to make some simplifying assumptions. And this is driven from work that Martin Bailey did back all the way back in 1981 and that uh, Bob Hall did uh, about 20 years later. Um, and the first is that we have competitive product markets, secondly, constant returns to scale, and thirdly, immediate factor adjustment. Um, but you can generalize that. And in, in 2002, in work I did with Lauren Hitt and Xinqiu Yang, um, we found that you can uh, use a longer investment series and measure the intangibles that way. Um, and you get the observed intangible capital that, that restricts price and quantity. And you also get the, the IT capital is related to the quantity through this adjustment cost schedule. So if you don't have instantaneous adjustments, depending on how big the adjustment costs are, you can back out the size of the intangibles. Um, and, and it's the, 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 a key um, assumption here 
is that you cannot instantaneously get the benefits from IT, that it takes a while to figure out how to use them. You know, these adjustment costs, depending on how big they are, is what drives a good part of the intangible asset. Um, and I'll as I'll show you in a minute, we'll, we'll get you get from this you get two equations and two unknowns that that separately identify both price and quantity. And that's really the main contribution of this paper is separating out not that we have intangible assets. I think a number of people have pointed that out, but separating out how much of that is due to price versus quantity and how that changes over time. So to be a little more precise. Um, here's a key estimating equation that we'll be using initially, and that is that the market value of the firm is a function of all the different assets in the firm. So specifically, uh, property, plants, and equipment, the first term, um, other assets, which include uh, cash and receivables, and then thirdly, IT. And what we're going to uh, look at is how the market value of the firm changes as these different components, these different assets change. Now, under instantaneous adjustment cost, as I initially mentioned, if, if, if you make that uh, assumption of instant adjustment cost, then the coefficients beta, each of those three betas, should be roughly equal to one. That is to say, one additional dollar of property, plant, and equipment should make the firm about one dollar more valuable. However, if there are adjustment costs, then it takes time to get value from them, and uh, therefore, the beta coefficient may be greater than one. And that reflects the fact that um, once a firm has these uh, other types of assets installed, it has undergone some costly adjustment and a competitor that simply bought the property plant and equipment would not instantaneously match the value creation. It would take some time and take some effort to do that. Um, and so we will estimate these uh, empirically. We have the data for all the variables there. And uh, you can do a little window around any given year to get an estimate, and then you can get a rolling change over time. And that's basically what we're going to be we're going to be doing. Um, Hi, Ari. So the, yes, um, I have a question regarding this regression. Um, sure. Um, what does IT component include all the digital capital you mentioned? Okay, so what, so what we're going to do is, we're, and in fact, that's what I'm going to show you right now, is the, the hardest part um, is to get the IT component. So that's the, that's the variable that's hardest to measure. And historically, it has not been good measures of that. Um, and so what we're going to do is use a new data series to get an estimate of how much IT each of these firms have. And we're going to be doing that from LinkedIn data. So LinkedIn is this big data set, as you can see here. Here's, a, here's one of my co-authors, Sunny Tambe. Um, and so uh, uh, hundreds of millions of people in the United States have uh, these LinkedIn profiles, especially people who work with IT, almost all of them do. And so we can map those to particular companies. We have a partnership with LinkedIn um, as part of the economic graph program. And so we know how much IT work there is done in each of these companies. And from that, we can infer how important IT is for each of the companies. And that's going to be our key IT measure. And then we're going to figure out the intangibles that are associated using that equation. So we, we, we have these, uh, these uh, observations and we can take the resumes and we can figure out not only for the current year, but for historical years, um, how many IT people there were in the company. In fact, we can go all the way back, believe it or not, about 30 years, which is older than LinkedIn, because people put their resumes up. And of course, the further back you go, the noisier it is. But we found that it's actually surprisingly uh, reliable and uh, plausible, the estimates we get going back um, about total of about 30 years. And this IT labor then becomes a proxy for the IT investment um, using the IT headcounts for the large firms from about the mid 1980s. Uh, through the, the past few years. And so here's a little bit of a, a, a series on that. Um, now, there are certainly a lot of challenges with this, and I want to just stress some of the difficulties of working with these data. Um, it's not like the U.S. Census that tries to exactly measure every firm. It, it's basically who wants to volunteer to provide their, their data. So you get very uneven sampling across different firms and industries. Um, what you can do is you can normalize it a bit. You can notice that there are certain types of jobs that people are more likely to post their resumes and other types of jobs less likely. Uh, normalize it by the BLS and other series, and then you can uh, back out a good estimate of, of how many that you may be missing in different categories. Um, 
And you know, there's always the possibility that people post false data and information. Uh, we hope that having a large data set helps mitigate that somewhat, but there's going to be certainly some noise in it. Now, fortunately, um, of the different categories that are represented on, on LinkedIn, IT is probably the number one or one of the number one. So people are pretty diligent of, if you're a software engineer or an IT worker uh, in using uh, the LinkedIn data set. So we get, you know, if not 100% coverage, pretty high coverage. Um, and you have to also compare to what are the alternatives. And right now, there's just not very many good alternatives for measuring IT hardware. So um, it gives us a fairly comprehensive and consistent data set, you know, certainly subject to some noise. Mm. Let me show you. Are, Go ahead. are yeah. there any differences between digital capital and IT human capital if we measure digital capital by using the headcounts of people from the LinkedIn website? Yeah, the well, link. I'm going to show you that right now, actually. Yeah. So, so now here are some of the, the regression results, and uh, we'll show you a couple of different measures of, of IT. So first, in the first column here, we're just going to do a relatively uh, standard um, production function where the uh, uh, dependent variable is value added by the firm. And we're going to look at, and in the first column one here, we're going to look at three inputs, uh, property, plant, and equipment, other assets, things like cash and receivables. And then our first measure of IT capital is going to be uh, just a direct hardware measure um, from uh, 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 Hart Hanks. And um, for this one, what you see is that the coefficient on property plant equipment is about 1.7, 1.76. So the way to interpret that is every additional dollar of property plant equipment that we see in the firm. Um, oh, by the way, sorry, I, I think I misspoke. Did I say this was... Um, Production function. This is a market value regression. So the dependent variable is, is market value. Um, so for every additional dollar of um, property, plant, and equipment, um, there's about 1.7 additional dollars of market value. Now, if, uh, if there was instantaneous adjustment, you'd expect the coefficient to be about equal to one. So the fact that it's 1.7 suggests that there's some small but significant adjustment costs accounting for the additional 0.7 of value that, that when you see a company with a, an additional factory or piece of uh, traditional equipment, um, it's more valuable than just buying that piece of equipment. There's some installation cost that also is implicitly valued there. Um, the, let me see, I think the, the next coefficient here um, is about 0.938. And that should be about equal to one if there's instantaneous adjustment. In this case, the, the coefficient is actually less than one. I, Gather the interpretation. It's not actually significantly different than zero than than one, but but you know the fact that it's slightly less maybe suggests that the investors don't think that they're going to get the full value when they see uh, you know a million dollars of cash on the balance sheet. They don't necessarily believe that they'll get a million dollars back out as investors. So the, the coefficient isn't quite equal to one, but it's it's pretty close to one, um, uh, close to the theoretical number. But the uh, the third value is is traditional IT hardware. Um, and that one, as you can see, is 15. So again, the, the theoretical coefficient would be one if there was zero adjustment cost. The fact that it's 15 suggests that there's some very large adjustment costs associated with um, these IT hardware capital um, assets. And so um, that is, and that's similar to research we did earlier with Shinkyu Yang and, and, uh, and Lauren Hitt. Now to answer your question, that's, that's using um, hardware measures. Um, which we only have available for a, a subset of the firms, um, but we have a broader, um, and, and we're controlling for industry fixed effects and year fixed effects as well. When you use um, IT labor, you also get a pretty large number, not, usually not quite as large as IT capital, it depends on the specification, um, anywhere from about nine to, to 16 or 17. Um, and that is uh, fairly comparable. And this, in this case, we're using IT labor from uh, from LinkedIn. So it is, a, it is a, a fairly comparable number, but we get a much longer data series and we get much more fine-grained uh, information about this. But again, the interpretation here is that when a firm has a certain amount of IT uh, labor um, in place, the, the, cap, the capitalized value of that, the market value is about 10 times larger. So um, to give you a sense of the time pattern, as I mentioned, you could do a window around any given year. Um, in the late 80s and early 1990s, uh, the total amount of 
market value of this IT associated intangible assets was relatively small. Um, then it really took off by the year 2000. You can see in the 1990s, it's growing very rapidly. This is the United States um, peaking in the year 2000. And then it, it kind of crashed and, and fell um, down to the recession in 2008. Um, and since then, it's been recovering uh, somewhat. Now, that's the total market value. Uh, I think we're more interested in, in what this pod paper is really contributing is separating that out into two components, the price and the quantity. Now, on the left is a simple, obvious equation that the total value is simply price times quantity. Um, but there's another equation that's a little subtler, but that's also important, which is that the changes in quantity, the percentage change in quantity, is a function of how much higher the price is than one. Um, and that's the Tobin's Q value. So um, as you get more and more rents or more and more value, there's more of an incentive to make investments. The speed of the adjustment is driven by that coefficient alpha, alpha sub C. But now you have two equations and two unknowns. Um, and we can, from this, understand how much of the value is associated with price and how much is associated with quantity. And uh, my Stanford colleague here, Bob Hall, really um, fleshed this out in a paper of his in, in 2001, although he didn't have the firm level data that we have to be able to define it more precisely. Um, Eric, before you move on, can I ask a question? Of course. Um, so if you go back one slide, or I guess now two slides. So when you showed this peak that was coming up here, right? you did these as market value regressions. And I guess I'm wondering how to separate that out from what was happening in the stock market, right? I mean, if the firms were sort of keeping their investment schedule pretty constant over time, but of course market values were going through the roof because we we're in the dot-com bust, what, well, I guess why should I think of that as being like, really reflective of this digital capital and not just sort of, you know, um, supply versus demand in the stock market. It, it is actually reflective of supply versus demand in the stock market. And that's exactly what you're exactly right. We're concerned about that, that part of what's happening is that you have the same amount of digital assets. You suppose you make zero investment, you just have the digital assets in place, then you get a higher price. The stock market is saying, well, we're, we're willing to pay more for those digital assets than we did before, or for that matter, your property, plant, and equipment, we're willing to pay more for, for all assets because of this stock market bubble or, or boom, depending on how optimistic you are. Um, and um, that's exactly the problem that we're concerned about is that um, some of the changes are simply due to, to price changes that investors are paying more for an asset without there actually being any additional amount of asset there. So we wanna separate out how much is due to, to the price effect versus to actual changes in the quantity. And, and the intuition um, is that um, um, if, if, there, if, if investors are willing to pay a lot for an asset, then if you're, you're smart, you're rational, there's a Q theory of investment, then you will, you, will, you will create more of that asset so you can get some additional value. That's what the market's telling you that this asset's super valuable, investors are willing to pay for it. And that's gonna lead to this adjustment of, of the quantity, the, the equation on the right. Now, you don't instantaneously, aren't able to instantaneously create that. So that's why this uh, alpha value um, gives you some sense of how rapidly you can adjust. You don't adjust instantaneously. So we are trying to separate out and understand how much of it is due to just you know, high stock market valuations or high prices versus actual real investment. So, so am I right in then in saying that when you talk about the P versus Q, so the P, the price part of this is going to encapsulate both changes in market value, which are just cut from what we were just talking about, but it would also like, if for something, something more fundamental happened in the, like IT actually became more productive, that might also be reflected in P, but you're yes. saying, look, I, but that P measure is sort of unclear. So we're not going to focus on that. But if we get the Q measure, then we feel much more confident that the Q measure yeah. is telling us real signal. Yeah, we don't know why people are paying a lot for it, um, but we just, we can just see that the price is, is very high. The investors seem to think for some reason that this stuff is really valuable. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but um, um, we will, you know, we will just uh, separate out how much is due to the higher prices they're paying, and how much is due to the actual quantity that's available. Now, with if it was physical stuff, you could count the number of your machines, that, or as you do, you know, count the number of of chips or processors or something like that. With intangibles, 
there's not an easy way to count it, but we can, through these equations, separate out how much is due to each of them. I think this, this little graphic, I mean, for me, I think more graphically than, than you know, algebraically, but it, it's the same thing as I just showed you in the previous slide. Um, the P v equals, uh, equals V over Q, or equivalently, you know, V equals Q times P, um, is that it's, I guess it's a hyperbola, that kind of a magenta or reddish looking hyperbola there. And the marginal adjustment cost is the other equation there, the line that is slightly upward sloping. Um, and at some point they cross and where they cross that pins down what price and quantity are equal to. And so we get some sense of, of, uh, of each of those. May I so, also ask uh, uh, two clarifying questions, Eric? Of course, please. So one is related to a new, new Thompson's uh, questions. Like if um, uh, some of the stop, you know, some of the, uh, stock price fluctuation reflects bubbles, and yes. the CEO of the company understands this. So, if CEOs un, uh, you know thinks you know, th your price movement is, has a bu bubble component and bubble can crash, potentially the quantity adjustment equation can deviate from what uh, Robert Hall uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes. derives, right? So, so, so yep. therefore the quantity derived may not be the in the, in the, in the mind of the CEO may not be the one described by the equation. That's one question. Right. I think you're right. I think that it, it well, so this equation uh, makes the simplifying assumption that, that, that there's a, a, you know, a, a constant adjustment cost for the price. Um, one could have a, a more complicated, perhaps more realistic, that uh, this alpha C depends on other circumstances that some kinds of price adjustments people pay attention to and other ones they don't pay attention to. This just assumes that, um, you know, that they treat them all equivalently. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, you could, of course, you could make all sorts of assumptions. You could assume that the CEOs are even more exuberant than the investors. And maybe when there's a, a, a stock market bubble, they, uh, they're even more excited or you could, you know, so, but, but the baseline no, assumption. But we can, so, sorry, I guess the, question, the follow-up question is, we have some, we, we can have some idea about whether CEOs are more or less uh, exuberant than market on average based on say their buyback behavior, these new stock issuance behavior and so on. They mm -hmm. have some idea. Like, so if, if, if CEO yeah. does other stuff, uh, they can uh, give us some hint about whether they think the market is over overvaluing or undervaluing. Exactly. So um, what I'm going to show you is that it turns out, luckily for us, that um, the exact values that we have are not terribly sensitive. I'm surprised how robust they are to different assumptions about um, alpha, the adjustment cost parameter. So um, you might think that it would make a huge difference, but it turns out that it, it doesn't make that big a difference um, what you assume for, for alpha. But I'll show you that in, a, in I don't know, like, I think four or five slides. May I slides. ask another clarifying question? Yeah, here? sure. So if I want to make a distinction between IT personnel versus IT in general, so IT in general could have personnel, hardware, software, mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. and maybe other stuff. Mm -hmm. Is it correct to think like, uh, you know, the way you, your approximation is, 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 is there's an implicit like a deontive production function that links the IT personnel with other stuff so that, you know, that sort of time series dynamics about IT personnel correspond to the time series dynamics of, of overall IT. Then I guess one of the questions is like, a, if the if the ratio, if the if the if the, if the, if the production coefficient, the coefficient between IT personnel and the rest, uh, you know, are there reason to think they could they, their ratio could also uh, you know fracture yes, absolutely over time and also differ across uh, firms? Totally. So this is an important assumption that we're making, which is probably not literally exactly correct. Which is that there's a, a, a consistent relationship between you know this amount of IT personnel and the other kinds of IT. I mean, if there's a if there's a consistent one to one, or for that matter, you know, five to one, or any constant ratio, yeah, um, then you're going to get right. these things. Yeah. But over time, it may be that um, that these ratios change, um, and that's going to be a concern. I, we don't have an easy way to uh, to address that. Um, but but the implicit assumption, I guess, the impl explicit assumption is that there's a this is a, a consistent value. I think that. Um, you know, it, the, the difficulty is that if, if we were to look at IT hardware, which I used to, I used to look more at IT hardware. Now, frankly, I, I prefer the IT labor uh, approach. Um, IT hardware also has a lot of changes. You know, everyone's moving to the cloud. And so the amount of IT hardware that a company has on premises, I think that's changing even more rapidly than labor. So um, if you have a certain number of data uh, engineers and, and others, um, that may be more consistent depending, even if you move some of the hardware 
to the cloud, some of the processing power to the cloud, whereas you still need those people to, to work with your team. Now, there is the question of IT outsourcing, um, and we've looked at that, and it, I was, it, 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 it's a significant component, but it, it's, not, it's not that large, um, and it, it's, it hasn't really changed that much over time, the amount of IT outsourcing. So that would be, that would be where the, the main concern would be, is, is that if this labor got switched um, you know, and was no longer accounted on the books. But that's gonna, all those things are going to add a certain amount of noise to these estimates, and, and that's why, as I showed you a little bit earlier, they do bounce around. Um, from, uh, you know, maybe point, you know, or from, from maybe from around a ratio of seven to a ratio of 15 or something like that. I think that the, the important thing is that they're, they're much, much larger than one. Um, let me, uh, uh Eric, yeah. can I ask a, a, a question too? Sure. Um, Go so ahead. the assumption you have about AI, you know, the constant return to scale, assum that assumption, mm -hmm. is it a proper assumption in the, in, for the case of AI, right? So when, you have, you know, a data set with three variables, probably you can do very little, right. you know, or, or, uh, extract very little information from that. But then yeah. when the data expands to a certain uh, scale, then a lot of things can be done. So yes. I wonder whether you have thought on whether the constant return to scale assumption uh, is a good one for the, for the setting you have. Yeah, you have, you have. I, I think it's, it's not a great assumption. It, it, you kind of need it to, it, it, it has, it goes back to whether you're looking at, marginal Q and average Q and, and, and estimating them. And um, yeah, I think that, you know, future work maybe by you or maybe by me, we'll, we'll look at, at trying to relax that assumption and seeing if we can still pin it down if we don't make that kind of assumption uh, going forward, because I, I think that it could, you could get some different kinds of results. You could have much larger uh, average Q values than marginal Q values, depending on, on what's happening with, uh, with constant returns to scale. So. I don't, I don't know for sure um, of a way of, of getting around that yet. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's something with, that Bob Hall and all of us have been, been, you know, by making that assumption, you can get these numbers pinned down, but it's, 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 it's an open question. Um, so let me, um, let me describe to you um, what happens um, once you separate out price and quantity. So the chart on the left is, is uh, what I showed you earlier, that the market value of IT, well, IT-related intangible capital, we're not calling it digital capital. I should have updated the slide, sorry. Um, so ITIC is the same as digital capital. IT-related intangible capital is what I used to call it in the paper. Um, and so on the left is the, you know how the market value went up and then down and then back up again. Um, but interestingly, it, 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 the two components, price and quantity, move very differently. Um, as, uh, as Neil and I were just talking about, you know, the, the, there's a dot-com bubble there in the late 90s and early 2000s that shot the price way up of a lot of assets. Market, you know, people were paying exuberant prices for uh, lots of assets. Um, and then they came down. And since then, since 2000, actually, the, the implied uh, value of, or the implied price, I should say, of IT related intangible capital or digital capital has been relatively constant, moving around a little bit, a little uptick there towards the past few years. But if you look at the quantity, um, that one grew a lot. Um, so both price and quantity grew in the 90s. Um, then it was pretty flat and now it's at an all time high. So we now have a lot more IT related intangibles or, or digital capital than we did before. So it, it's kind of useful to separate these out. And I think you can kind of eyeball if you multiply the, the second chart times the third chart, you get the first chart, um, price times quantity equals more total value. Now here's um, some people asked about the adjustment cost, go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, I wonder the ITIC you mentioned is a combination of the IT personnel and IT hardware, right? No, um, the ITIC, ITIC is the intangibles associated with IT. Okay. So, so this is the this is the amount of intangibles associated with IT. So if you install some IT equipment, as a function which includes both the capital and the labor, how many additional intangible value is there for, in terms of business process changes in the rest of the organization? And those can be 10 times larger than the, uh, than the direct um, IT shop. So, so a company might spend, okay. uh, as I mentioned, $10 million on an ERP system, but another $100 million on these uh, intangibles that are associated with it. That's what we're measuring okay. here. Yeah, okay. I remember there are some studies showing that the price of IT capital declined very quickly. Maybe that's for the hardware. If yeah, yeah. That's the hardware. Price. So the, yeah. the price of, of computer hardware has certainly declined a very large yeah. amount. So this is not the computer hardware. This is the 
the new business process, all the value of those intangibles that are associated with it. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that's what we're, that's what this paper is much more focusing on is the changes in business processes, you know, the, the new ways of organizing business, the way that, a, maybe we should describe more the way that uh, a company like Dell, when they install, let, let me, let me take a minute to talk about that. It's kind of important. Um, so I've been doing some work with, with, with Dell and, and uh, they had to double their output and, and uh, they have more demand for computers. You could do it in, in a couple of different ways. One thing you could take your factory and you can make a second factory next to the first one. You'd have twice as many uh, buildings, twice as many pieces of machinery, twice as much output, twice the physical capital. Another way you could do it is you could take your existing factory and you could use IT to make it more efficient, introduce new business processes, um, connect with the supply chain more efficiently, optimize the flow of materials. If you used IT to revolutionize the way you run your current factory, you might be able to double the output from your existing factory. Both of those approaches would lead to twice as much output. One of them would double your physical capital. The first way would double your physical capital. The second way doesn't change your physical capital, but it increases your intangible capital. You now have some new business processes. And what we're looking at is that second way is how much value is there in that second way of using IT and other you know, business process innovations to increase output. Now, the thing about increasing intangible assets is they don't tend to show up on the balance sheet. There's no generally accepted accounting principle that says, you know, we have uh, invested in new business processes and they're now worth, you know, a billion dollars. So we have to use these techniques. However, investors will look at the company and say, wow, they're producing twice as many computers every year as they used to. They must have some intangible assets that are very valuable. So... Maybe I should have uh, you know, taken a minute to explain that before, but we're in this paper looking at trying to pin down how much of that intangible value is created. I think in many ways, it's similar to physical assets. The biggest difference is you can't touch it. It's not tangible, but it does take a lot of effort to create. You can't just snap your fingers. You have to work very hard to create these intangible assets. And it does create value, a stream of revenues, a stream of output, over a number of years. So in that sense, you invest in it and then you get returns and, and, and uh, uh, the stock market and investors will appreciate that. And they'll say, hey, you guys at Dell, you have something pretty valuable there and we're willing to, uh, to value your company higher since you have it, just like they would value it higher if they saw you had two factories instead of one factory. Does that help with what we're going at? Hi, Eric. Yes, hi. Uh, this is long. Uh, so. Uh, can you explain again in very simple terms, how do you differentiate price versus quantity? So basically we're trying to capture the, the high valuation or the, the, this part. And we can see that it has a lot to do with the uh, IT capital. But mm -hmm. uh, how do you capture that the, the price part? It, it's not exactly going up, but it's really the quantity part. Mm -hmm. What exactly is the, identification that make you to separate them. Mm -hmm. So we can measure the total value um, from the original equation that I just said, you know, here going back. Right, uh, right. And so we get these coefficients here. And so we know the total value. And now if it's just the stock market, as, as Neil was asking, um, then we would see, you know, well, and then, you know, this first equation is, is hopefully pretty obvious that, that the, the value is just defined as price times quantity. We, we don't know, we don't initially know the difference between price and quantity. All we do is measure value. So we know right. the value goes up and down, but we don't know how much of it's due to price and how much of it's due to quantity. Um, actually, can you see my pointer? I don't think you can, you or not? Yeah, yes, we can. You do see my pointer. Okay. So you can see that I'm pointing to P now and then Q. Oh, I don't see the pointer, but I see the slides. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what. Okay. So, um, so the, you see, you, you, we don't initially know the difference between the two of them. However, um, that's where the second equation comes in. And the idea here is that companies do, cannot instantaneously create additional intangible capital. It takes time. And um, so the quantity in any given year compared to the quantity in the year before is going to be a function of how much higher the price is than one. One, one is sort of the, 
the, the numerary, the, the, the base value. So if P equals to one, then you're, you're happy with where it is. But if P is greater than one, so we, we've normalized it, I should say, we, we've normalized price here to be where one is the base um, uh, the, the neutral value. So if price is higher than that, then you're going to have more rapid adjustments. So we see the time series. In order to do this, we need to look at the changes over time and we can see how much additional quantity there each is each year and how much that correlates with price. And indeed, what we see is that when prices are higher, companies invest more in intangible capital and, and they, they invest less. And th the speed of this adjustment is going to be given by uh, alpha. So if, uh, uh, if uh, alpha is, well, like an extreme case, if, if alpha is zero, then you just don't adjust at all. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, yeah. So, so um, these two equations will give you an estimate of the quantity and the price any given year. But uh, it's going to depend. Unfortunately, we don't observe alpha directly either. So although we can now pin down price, if we knew alpha, we'd be done. But you have to make some assumption about what alpha is, how quickly things adjust. Um, we'll start with an assumption that alpha is equal to three here. Um, but you could make other assumptions. And let me just show you that it's not that sensitive. Let's see, I think I hear. Yeah, here we go. So, so this separates price into these different things. This, is, uh, this chart assumes alpha is equal to three. But here... Um, you can see on the left, we make different assumptions. Um, the blue, the green line in the middle is alpha equal to three. But if we made alpha twice as big, say alpha equal to six, then you get the blue line. Or if you made it half as big, say alpha equal to 1.5, then you get the red line. The good news is, you know, that's a pretty wide range of adjustment costs and you get fairly similar values depending on it. So, you know, um, the, depending on how rapidly you think things adjust, you get, you get yeah. fairly similar kinds of values. So um, that's, that's how you, you back it out based on the adjustment cost. And the second, the other thing, but we have to make another assumption. <laughs> so there's a number of assumptions in here. I want to show you how robust they are. Uh, you also need an initial value. I guess you don't see it here, but Q, you know, the, very, the very beginning, the very first period, we don't know what the quantity was initially. It, once you have a value, you can do it in, in different ones. So if you assume no initially back in the beginning of our time series in 19, uh, I guess, 86, there was absolutely zero intangible capital. There was absolutely zero digital capital. Then that would be the, the red line there. Um, and um, as you can see, it incredibly rapidly converges. By the early 1990s, all the lines are basically identical. So... If you assume a large amount of initial intangible capital or a small amount or a medium amount, you pretty quickly get the same basic values because over time- so what, so what does the convergence mean here then? What the convergence means is that any given year, you look at the amount of quantity of intangible capital and then it changes to the next year and the next year. And you, you have a whole series from year to year to year. But we don't know what the very first value was. Um, we don't because we don't know what what it was. We're, all we can look at is the changes in value. So okay. you, you, we, you can pick a number. Just pick a number for the first year. Turns out it doesn't matter. Just pick a number for the first year, and then it adjusts to the second year, and then adjusts to the third year, and so forth. And uh, it will matter for the first couple of years. But um, you know, suppose we pick the number zero for the first year. So that's a pretty conservative number. Assume that there was no digital capital in 1986. It didn't exist. Then within a few years, you get a time series that looks very similar to if you assumed it was equal to say 20% of property paint equipment, or you could assume it was equal to 40%. You could pick you know, lots of different values. So the point of these two charts is simply to show you that although we don't know what alpha is, we don't know what the capital initial capital amount was, it's not very sensitive to either of those numbers um, that um, I, we picked yeah. you know, three for alpha and we picked uh, an initial value of zero, but it, it, it will get, we'll get all of our results are pretty much the same regardless of, of what assumptions you make. I guess we're, we're lucky that it just turns out to be fairly robust. I guess we're not entirely lucky. I mean, when, when, when Bob Hall wrote this up in his initial 2001 paper, um, he argued that they would be uh, not very sensitive to these values. And, and Bob's a smart guy. He was right about that. And when we, when we plugged the numbers in, it turned out not to be very sensitive. Got it. Okay, please go ahead. So um, 
Another way to look at this is, is the red part here is the in, uh, digital capital, the IT related intangible capital. And the blue part is the traditional property plant and equipment. So the, the, the or I don't know whether that's blue or green, that, that bottom part, um, bluish green. And the, um, what you see is that, um, you know, in traditional uh, growth accounting, we, we measure the traditional property plant and equipment that's been growing fairly rapidly over time. Uh, but even more rapidly growing has been intangible capital or digital capital. And so now it accounts for about 25% of the total assets of American firms. So it went from almost zero to about 25%. And here's what I mentioned earlier that, that it's, it's not, it's very uneven. It's remarkable how skewed the results are. So if you look at the top 10% and the next 10% and all the different uh, deciles, all the different 10 different deciles, what you see is that the top 10% of firms have had an enormous increase in digital capital. That's the, uh, the yellow golden line near the top there. Uh, the next 10% also have a little bit of an increase, but the bottom 80% has had essentially no change since the year 2000. There was some increase in the 90s, but since the year 2000, there's been almost no change in any of the other firms in the economy. So basically all of the, uh, the increase has been in the top 10 or 20%, most of it in the top 10% of firms. And we call these the superstar firms. These are the uh, a few firms that are pulling away from the rest. In this chart here, in the paper we do, we slice it different ways, but in this chart that I'm showing you right now, we specifically exclude um, all the firms that didn't exist back in 1986. So this, this is a balanced panel here. This excludes Google and uh, 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 Amazon and Facebook and, and the big uh, digital giants. Um, instead, it only includes firms that have been around through the entire period. And it, it's through all the different industries. If we were to include Google and Facebook and, and so forth, the numbers would be even more skewed. So it'd be even more extreme. But I just want to emphasize that this is not just driven by a, 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 you know, the famous um, digital giants. It's something that's happening throughout the economy. Um, but it is definitely a, a, a very skewed distribution in, in all these different industries. Certain firms in each industry are, uh, are aggressive, aggressively investing in digital capital, and most of them are not. And Eric, yep. um, I wonder what's the relationship between the kind of, uh, quantity of IT capital and firm size. Do you have a sense on, on that correlation? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, well, actually, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, roughly speaking, it, it's um, it's it's proportional that you know bigger firms tend to have more um, digital capital, but it's it's not it's not disproportionate. It's not just in bigger firms. So this top ten percent of firms is the ten percent that have the most digital capital. It's not necessarily the, the ones that are biggest on other dimensions, although they they are correlated. But that's yeah, a question. I, I, I should. I don't know if I should go back and look at it a little bit more carefully. I, I, I think we looked at it, I just don't remember the answer. Um, I don't think it was, um, it was a very skewed though, as best I can recall. You, you can have some firms that were small in other dimensions and still have a lot of digital capital, but it's roughly proportional. Uh, Eric, is the top 10% uh, percent of the firms kind of held constant in this graph or they could be changing, shifting you know, into, uh, across buckets over time? This, this one is holding them constant. Um, yeah, so this one is, is just looking at, at, at the firms that were highest. And it, so it's, it's a completely balanced panel. Um, in the paper, we slice it lots of different ways. And the lines, they look kind of similar. They look, you know, depending on things you do, you, you, they'll, it'll grow somewhat faster if you have a changing bucket over time. It also grows somewhat faster if you allow entrance and exits. Um, so this, in a way, is the most conservative version of the charts. Okay. So just, just follow up question. That, that means the classification of uh, which bucket a firm goes in is based on exposed uh, size, exposed uh, digital capital size. No, I think it's based in the midpoint. I'll, I'll have to go back. It, might, it might, might be the beginning or the midpoint. I don't think it's at the end. Uh, I don't know that it makes a big difference, but uh, I, think, I think we did it by the average or the midpoint. Okay, and that's the, do, do I understand, maybe I missed something. The quantity variable essentially is, is some multiples of uh, IT personnel. Is that roughly yes. right? Okay. Right. Okay, so, so this just says, if you look at the 
where are the IT people uh, uh, employed? The LinkedIn data tells us they tend to be, this is a very skewed picture, you know, you know, they go to- No, no, it's that the in, intangibles associated, so, so some firms get a lot more intangibles associated with them. So we, we do it in different subgroups. So what does that mean to doing, by, by doing in different subgroups? Um, let me think about this. I'll need to get back to you on exactly how okay. we how we separate that. Yeah, I have to think about what we did. Yeah. Um, uh, my my question is really about depreciation. We haven't seen this uh, in the two previous equations for price and quantity decomposition. But uh, think about capital and uh, IT labor. The two things have quite different depreciations. And uh, what's the role in your decomposition when you? taking into account the depreciation, depreciation rate. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we can also uh, estimate depreciation. It's uh, uh, some results I don't have uh, the slides for, but um, they, well, maybe I have some uh, in my back. Let me just see if I can find the depreciation slides here. Hang on. Let me, uh, let me bring up the depreciation slides. I think they're in here somewhere. Yes, you, you, definitely, you definitely can estimate it, but when yeah. you use IT capital uh, for decomposition, then this capital, well, the capital depreciates faster than human capital or right. IT labor, right? Yes. So there's a systematic difference in using the different measures right. to do that. Right. That's right. I have to say, I, I didn't... I didn't keep the, uh, the slide on depreciation. We, it's in the paper. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, so we did calculate the depreciation rates differentially. And the what we found was that the uh, intangible assets, if I'm remembering correctly, depreciated somewhat faster than other kinds of capital. Um, and it depended on some of the assumptions. That I, I, I just, I don't remember the exact estimates of the of the depreciation rates and how that varied by the different capital but it's uh i, I can get back to you it's, it's, it's actually in the paper and i'll, I'll i can do that up and, and 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 send that yeah of course thanks um so the let me just um talk a little bit about the uh production function side so what i've been showing you so far is the market value this is what investors pay so the the idea is that investors see the value created by these intangible assets and they're willing to pay more for a company uh, that has more of the intangible assets. Um, but we also see that once you've estimated the intangible asset, assets, the IT-related intangibles or the digital capital, we're using those terms interchangeably, um, you can run a production function and take the value we get from the intangibles and see if it's predictive of output. So what we have here is a series of uh, production functions we're now, instead of market value as a dependent variable, we have value added as a dependent variable. And uh, uh, so you can see here in the first column, this is a, a traditional uh, production function where you have uh, non-IT capital, labor, and then IT capital. And the uh, coefficient on each of them is roughly equal to their, their factor shares. So non-IT capital is about 26% of output. Uh, labor about 65 or 66%. And IT capital is about 4.6%. Um, but then we can add, something no one's done this before really, is, is add um, the intangible assets. And that's another about three or 4% of output. In fact, it, it knocks down the coefficient on IT there a little bit. So some of what we had been measuring as IT capital is actually the intangibles that are correlated with IT capital. And um, it's fairly- Sorry, the, uh, Go ahead. IT labor is, a, is the, within the labor component, right? Or within the yeah, IT capital. Yeah, uh, so the writing is a little bit sloppy there. Yeah, it, yeah. it's included in the IT capital uh, one. So we were using IT labor as a proxy for IT capital. Um, so, you know, it's uh, maybe we should just call it IT. We shouldn't call it IT capital, yeah. Um, but we're thinking about this as, as, as a proxy for the, the IT component. So, and what you see is that the, the intangibles is, is equal to or larger than the direct IT component. And uh, 
once you once you plug them in, you get a, you know a, a production function that shows that the intangibles are predictive of value add output um, over time. This is the contemporaneous one, but we also did ones where you can look at it predicting into the future up to about three years into into the future. Now, let me talk a little bit about what's happening to total factor productivity over time, not just in, at the firm level, and whether or not um, the existence of these intangibles is going to lead you to overestimate or underestimate productivity. Um, and it's going to depend on the growth rate of intangibles. In particular, um, if um, intangibles are being created faster than they're being harvested, faster than they're being used, then total factor productivity is going to be underestimated. Um, the idea is that we are using some tangible inputs. We're using some real resources, some traditional capital and labor in order to create intangibles, in order to create new business processes. So, um, you know, think of that example where Dell is trying to figure out how to run their factory more efficiently. They'll be taking a bunch of managers and software engineers and, and other uh, resources to reinvent their business processes. That uses up resources. It doesn't directly lead to more computers coming out of the uh, factory. So um, it appears that their productivity is lower, but we know that they're creating some intangible assets. They're just not showing up as measured output. So during this period, while true factor productivity might be growing, the measured productivity would tend to be suppressed or underestimated. However, later, now that they've built those business processes and now the factory is running, having used these new intangible uh, assets, now we're going to be creating more output out of the factory without using additional hardware or software or equipment or bricks or mortar. And at this point, it looks like the factory is, is surprisingly productive. It's creating a lot of output. Um, part of that is because it's using intangible assets that we weren't counting. So during this period, total factor productivity will be overestimated. So since traditional productivity measure does not properly measure the intangibles, it's going to first underestimate and then later overestimate um, total factor productivity. Now there's a special case where it gets it exactly right. And that is that when the creation of intangibles exactly equals the harvesting of intangibles. So in, in sort of a steady state where you're, you're producing and consuming the same amount of intangibles, then you'll get uh, zero mismeasurement. Um, so in the long run, you could argue that you're not going to have mismeasurement, but during a period where you're building up assets, you're going to underestimate and then later overestimate if you're consuming them. Eric, uh, can I ask yeah. a clarifying question? Sure. Um, yeah, if I understand you correctly, you decompose uh, market value into P and Q and call some of that to be the digital capital, but market value reflects market expectation into the future, right? To, so in some extent, the digital capital you're measuring are sort of expectation of investors about the value of the IT labor in this company that could go into the future, not just today's um, intangible capital. Um, but now you're running the um, total productivity factor regression, treating the tang intangible assets as if it already exists. So I'm a little confused of this expected future intangible capital versus what's already existing today and contributing to today's productivity. So could you explain? Maybe I misunderstand the- Sure, no, no, that, that's a really important point. I'm glad you asked. So the investors care about uh, future cash flows um, and the net present value of all the future cash flows. And that's gonna be a function of, you know, what they think the firm will be able to produce. That in turn is a function of the assets that the firm has in place. Now let's just set aside the intangibles for a minute. Let's just think of ordinary assets. So if a firm, buys a piece of equipment, that's going to create cash flows for a number of future years. And the market value that the investors put on that firm is going to represent what they think the value of that asset is, how much that equipment can produce, uh, how much energy does it take to use to run it, and then how much additional output can it use. And if the output that it creates is greater than the inputs it uses, that's going to create a, a, 
uh, value that the investors say, okay, this company is creating some value. And so when they see, say, $100 million worth of equipment in the factory, the reason they say it's $100 million is that they expect it over the next 10 years to create $100 million worth of value. If that equipment um, was worthless, let's say that it used just as much energy as it produced, then they would put a value of $0 on that equipment, right? Does that make sense? So the investors are valuing the asset based on its the net present value of its future cash flow. So those are equivalent. Those are not two different ways. It's not that they have any, you know, if they're, you know, I'm assuming the investors are trying to be rational and, you know, you could, you could throw irrational exuberance or whatever on top of that, but let's just assume the investors are, are trying their best to value the company based on its future cash flows. That's what those assets are worth. If the building produces cash flows, it's worth that. If it's equipment's worth cash flows. Likewise, now let's go over to intangibles. Suppose um, the company has some business processes that it thinks will generate $100 million worth of cash flows over the next five or 10 years. Then it's going to say, we're willing to pay $100 million for a company with those intangibles. And they look at another company next door that's identical, that does not have these intangibles. They'll pay $100 million less for that other company. So the value of the intangibles is equal to the future cash flows that are going to be generated from it, you know, including that year. So there, there, um, there's no, you know, there's not, there's just one way of, of calculating it, 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 both the, 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 the value of the asset and the, and the future cash flows are, are meant to map to the same concept. Does that help? I'm, I'm not sure I yes. totally answered your question. Does that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And does that require assumption that um, the, the amount that investors are willing to pay is a constant multiple of the actual intangible capital? Do you need that relationship to be sort of linear? No. Um, what it, what, what, I mean, this is, gets into, so the investors may pay a higher price or a lower price for any given asset. Um, depending on you know whatever their exuberance or the interest rates or things like that, and so that's going to you know take that up and down. But when we go back to the production function here, uh, what we're finding is that on average these intangible assets do predict output. Um, you know, but but you're right. If, if, if that number would be different, that I guess in this case, uh, 0.76 or 7.6 percent of output being accounted for by intangibles, that number would be different if, uh, if we had, if the investors put different valuations. I see, thank you. Sure. Um, talked about that. Um, so this is just again, reminding you that, that you know, this, this Q theory of investment that basically tells you that the value of the firm is a function of, it, of its assets. In this case, we're calling it, you know, Lambda. Um, will is how much the intangibles are. If lambda is equal to one, then the value of the assets is exactly equal to the, uh, the sorry, I should say that the value of the firm is exactly equal to the sum of its assets, its capital assets. If lambda is greater than one, then what that means is that every dollar of say computers can generate more than $1 of market value because um, it's costly for a competitor to, to mimic it. Um, now, with a little bit of algebra, this has some implications for productivity and production, productivity and growth accounting. Um, so this looks a little complicated. Let me walk you through it, um, the different components here. The, the left-hand two terms, I think I shade them here. Yeah, these terms here, um, they are just uh, traditional uh, solo growth accounting. Basically what it says is that the growth in output, G sub Y, is a function of the changes in capital K dot over K times the productivity of capital. That's the term to the left of that. Plus the growth in labor. In this case, we used N for labor. I, maybe I should have used L. Um, and uh, the changes in labor times the productivity of labor. So that's your total output is equal to just the solo you know, capital and labor contributions. But now we have some new terms, in particular, this uh, lambda term which tells you how, how adjustment costs add to it. So once you have these uh, intangibles where the, you have positive adjustment costs, the growth accounting equation becomes a little bit different and includes a term 
that shows you how much additional output, how much growth is due to these uh, intangibles and the investment in the intangibles and then the harvesting of the intangibles that I implied earlier. And by the way, the last term there is just the total factor productivity term. Um, when, you, when you subtract one year's growth from the next year's growth, you can isolate how much the traditional uh, total factor productivity is different from the one including the intangibles. So that the G sub TFP, that the right-hand term there is, um, is just the traditional solo total factor productivity um, growth. G star is when you include intangibles. If intangibles were zero, the numbers would be the same. But if intangibles are important, you get um, a difference here. And let me walk you through. Let me do I shade these? No, I don't. Okay. Um, so there are three components here, each in parentheses. Um, let me go from the far right. If the growth rate of intangibles, the investment is the same as the growth rate of capital, then the right-hand term is equal to zero. So then you have no mismeasurement. So as, if they're both growing at exactly the same rate, there's no mismeasurement. That's the steady state. Remember earlier I said that if they're, if they're steady state, then we have no mismeasurement. Um, secondly, the, the, going backwards, if you look at the Z sub I over Y, uh, so Z times I over Y, what that's telling you is that, that if the investment rate, the key thing there is, is I, the investment rate, if the investment rate were equal to zero, if there's no investment, then you'd also have no mismeasurement. And finally, the, the, uh, the first term after the summation with the lambda there, that says that if lambda over Z was equal to one, that is to say, if the um, uh, uh, coefficient was exactly equal to one, there was no uh, net adjustment cost, then that would also equal zero. So if any of those three terms is equal to zero, then you have no mismeasurement. But um, in general, I think all of those terms are likely to be uh, different than zero. So you are going to have some mismeasurement and total factor productivity growth is either gonna be underestimated or overestimated depending on the size of those different terms. And uh, this is the work I did with Chad Severson and, um, and Daniel Rock, where we worked out the dynamics of what that means for overall productivity growth in the economy. And uh, I think the easiest way to see it is this graphical term here. I'm particularly focused on the blue line, which is the total mismeasurement. What you see is that under uh, plausible parameters, you get a, a J curve. You can see first it goes down and then it goes up. Um, the intuition is that when you make an intangible investment, it's costly to make that investment and your measured productivity falls because you're spending time and effort building business processes, building intangibles but it's not showing up as additional output. Then later you harvest it and now the curve is above zero. Um, and that's during that period you're harvesting it, you get some, some benefits, um, but it's, they, they seem like they're magical. They're coming out of thin air because you didn't count the intangibles. In reality, of course, we know that they're coming from your investment in the intangibles. Uh, if you're completely rational um, and you make perfect uh, investments, then the uh, integral of the area below zero is equal to the integral of the area above zero, and you are harvesting exactly as much as you invested. Uh, and that's sort of your expected term, but it, it may be in, in reality that you sometimes overestimate or underestimate. But this gives you this productivity J curve. Um, and in the, in the paper there that I have there at the bottom, the productivity J curve that we have in the American Economic Journal of Macroeconomics that just came out in January of this year, um, we go ahead and, and calibrate that for software and hardware and other investments. And we find that there's a, quite a bit of uh, pent up value. We've created uh, trillions of dollars in the United States economy of intangible assets that are not measured elsewhere. And as we harvest those, uh, productivity growth in the coming years is likely to be significantly higher because we have made these kinds of investments that uh, they were very costly and they took, uh, in, uh, over a decade to create these investments. And now we're in a position to start harvesting them. Um, I'm looking at the Eric, clock. Eric, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go can, ahead. Can I, ask, can I ask a question on that? And I think this, this ties to sort of the, the larger paper here. Yeah. So, um, if, you know, if I understand that the way that this sort of intentional capital is being calculated, it's really the you observe something and you say, oh, you know, the investors are assuming that the return to that will be much higher. Yes. And we think in a typical productivity model, uh, we should get the sort of marginal returns of these different factors to equal. And so there must be some missing capital or asset that we had to invest in, right. which is then going to equalize those things, right? Correct. So 
Can you distinguish that and like, and in particular, you know, how it's going to influence something like this? If we told a different story, which was more sort of technology driven, so you'd say something like, "Hey, if you install a database, a database can help you with certain things in your company, but not all of them. But if it gives you like a big boost, like significantly higher than other ways of investing, right? You would expect a larger return to that to that IT capital." But it isn't necessarily that you had to do all those other processes. It can just be that you can't equalize because you can't put a database everywhere within your company. And so there, the additional sort of value that you observe in IT capital comes not from like that there's some investment that we're missing, but just because the returns are actually higher. And for some technological reason, we can't sort of diffuse it through the company. And so I right. guess I'm and so I, so I'm wondering like how, if you sort of like, do you believe that second story? And if so, like, how would it affect this kind of result? So the second story is actually not that different than the first story. So that you, one way to think about the second story is that there's some adjustment cost to that, that when you install a piece of equipment, I guess, or, a, or the database, as you're saying, that um, the other part of the company or, or some competitor, um, in order to get the benefits, it, they, suppose they also install a, a database they don't instantaneously get benefits from it because you need to make some of these other changes or maybe they're not in a situation maybe to really get the benefit from the database you need a, a more complicated product line if you only have one product then you know a database not so valuable but if you have a thousand products then the database is very valuable so you really need to rethink your product line to get full advantage the data, database gives you the option of, of having much more sophisticated product line or much more sophisticated interactions with your customers so in order to get the full benefit of these new technologies, you need to make changes in the rest of your organization. Those are the adjustment costs, or equivalently, those are the intangible assets that you're investing in. Now, um, you could take two extreme cases. Uh, one extreme case is that you very quickly make those other adjustments, in which case your competitor would instantly match you and you have no excess value. The lambda would be you know, equal to zero. Um, another possibility, is that the um, the competitor just cannot, no matter what, invest in it. Now, now that you know Lambda is almost infinity or very, very high, it's very hard. The, the more realistic case is in the middle that the competitor could, with some effort, make some changes. And that's why the, uh, the value is, is um, greater than one, but it's not you know, infinitely high. So the competitors will eventually be able to make those comparable intangible investments but it, but it takes time. But uh, you know, at some level, and this is in the paper I did with Xing Qiu Yan Yang, you know, some years ago, the adjustment cost concept and the intangible asset concept kind of map into each other. Um, the reason that there are these intangible assets is that you can think of them as as an additional cost you have to pay on top of the capital, on top of the uh, technology investment to get the benefits. Um, does that does that get your question, or uh, I, I hope that helped? But, but feel free to uh, to ask again if, if I didn't quite get it. Yes, yeah, so that that wasn't quite what I meant. I mean, I, I I take your point, and I completely agree that those two things map directly onto each other. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking more of a situation where, you know, maybe the production function of the firm just you know there there's some place where you could slip in a piece of IT equipment, yeah. but it's not like you could adjust, like you can't do all these other things that, you're, that we've been talking about of saying, well, I'm going to totally rearrange my production process, or I'm going to take better advantage of it. And there's just like some piece yeah. of your, your thing has just become like four times as efficient as it was before. Mm -hmm. And you'd expect that to, re if the price of that thing was competitive, then you'd expect that return to be much higher, but you right. wouldn't necessarily expect any like adjustment that you'd be able to do later is just you just got more efficient. And I that seems like that would also generate right. these excess returns, which are being measured yeah. here as intangible. Yeah, value. well, so let, me, let me try again. So, so suppose you got you know this part that was four times more efficient and suppose your competitor instantaneously matched it and also got four times more efficient. Then you would get zero excess returns. Your investors wouldn't see anything. So you wouldn't actually get any benefit um, in terms of the, the investors. And so it wouldn't show up as an asset. The reason that you get more returns is that your competitors do not instantly match it. And so that difference between that adjustment cost uh, that allows you to have a period where you earn some rents, that's what the investors are, are paying for. They're saying, you've got something that other people can't instantly get. And because it takes some time for them to install and match you, you have a period where you can earn some rents. 
And that's what's going to show up in the market value. Um, and that's what's going to show up in those equations. So, you know, I, I, I said it, I didn't really get into this, but really what matters, if you think about it, is not your own adjustment cost, it's your competitor's adjustment cost. That when you make an investment, you get returns on that insofar as other firms in the economy have some adjustment costs that they have to match to get to you. If you somehow were able to do the investment and have zero adjustment costs, uh, that, that would be great. And you would get a, get a return as long as the other firms had positive adjustment costs. And so that this, this Lambda that I've been focusing on, actually, to be more precise about it, is the adjustment costs of, your, of the other firms in the economy. I mean, if they're all the same, it doesn't matter. But what really, you know, the, the part that drives your, your returns to your investors is the fact that other people can't instantaneously match what you're doing. Yeah, and that okay, that's that's very helpful, and I think it it, it reveals as well. There's this implicit assumption about a competitive end market for your product. Yeah, right? exactly. It, otherwise, so you it, could. It's not perfectly it. competitive though, because it, it's well. I guess it depends how you define it, but it it, it they, they have to make these other investments to, to match you, and and you know to make it even more you know general. In a way, it's just like when you buy a piece of equipment, they also have to buy a piece of equipment to match you. So. There's a kind of a deep analogy between the intangible assets and the tangible assets. If you buy a piece of equipment that generates value, the competitors don't get to have that same value unless they also buy the piece of equipment. If you create some intangible assets that create value, your competitors don't get to have the same value unless they also invest in those intangible assets. And how, how hard is it for them to match that? Well, that's going to be a function in part of these adjustment costs. Now, I'm looking at the clock. I have just a couple more minutes, so let me just uh, pop ahead to the to the last uh, couple of slides here. Um, I guess, you know, we can also dive in deeper on AI and in the paper, we describe a little bit about the different categories of AI. Um, I could I have some examples here of self-driving cars. I'm just gonna skip through those. Um, and uh, I'm gonna skip through the story of electrification and just get to the summary here. So, um, uh, so as I mentioned, we can measure the market value of digital capital. That's the first thing we did. And we were able to separate that out into prices versus quantities. We found that uh, initially prices bounced around quite a bit, but uh, more recently, it's been mostly the quantities. And uh, in the last year of our, our sample, about 20 to 25%, a little bit more than that by now, um, of the total capital value in firms, we can attribute to a particular category of intangibles, specifically the intangibles that are associated with IT, which we call digital capital. Um, not all firms were investing in this. Um, in fact, surprisingly small set, like about 10% of the firms accounted for the majority of the digital capital in the US economy. And that gap was getting wider and wider. They're pulling away. So we're not seeing firms catching up. We're seeing more and more inequality in, in firms um, and more and more unevenness. Um, the firms that had more digital capital had significantly more productivity, more output. Um, and that was true for the general kinds of IT capital. Uh, I just skipped the past couple of slides where I showed you there was some data. We can specifically look at IT-related intangible assets. Those we did not see adding much to productivity. So the productivity that these firms, the excess productivity, not excess, but the additional productivity that they're getting is from other kinds of IT and software. AI, we did not see yet being associated with additional productivity. Um, you can go from the firm level up to the macro economy, like with the J curve. And what we see is that um, they are, we probably are significantly underestimating productivity growth right now because we're not counting the growth of intangible capital. If we counted the additional production of intangibles, um, we would have much higher output measures. We'd be creating trillions of dollars of additional output that isn't showing up. Just like if we built more factories, we would count that as GDP building invisible factories made out of uh, business processes also you could argue should add to GDP. I mean, that's not the way they count GDP, but, but um, it, it is creating productive potential. And in future years, I expect us to be harvesting more of that. And so that should lead to higher measured productivity. Um, and this leads to what we call the productivity J curve, a period where at first we were investing in intangibles and that leads to an underestimate of productivity and later we'll be harvesting them. So I'll end on an optimistic note and say that I expect uh, over the coming years, we're gonna have a productivity boom as um, 
our data suggests that there's a lot of intangibles that have not yet been accounted for, and these intangibles are uh, in position to be harvested. And uh, if our theory is correct, we should have significantly higher productivity in the coming years. Um, you can read the paper. There's one called Digital Capital that describes this. There's also one called the Productivity J Curve. There's one called, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get to um, AI and, and productivity, the modern productivity paradox that uh, describes other reasons why we have a bit of a productivity slowdown. And they're all available for free on my website there. Uh, I guess we're technically out of time, but I'm happy to take an additional question or comment. If, uh, if we have time for that, I'll leave it to the uh, organizers to uh, decide exactly how much we can go over. Yeah, I think we can go over a little bit. Any more questions for Eric? Eric, this is a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. This is Xiangqing Wu here. Can, can I ask you to comment or maybe speculate on something on your, you can leave your uh, conclusion slide on maybe. Uh, you know, I, I see like a potentially two factors that's not uh, uh, either not in your framework or not, you have not uh, had a chance to talk about uh, and how would they affect the, the, the key conclusions. One, one is, uh, uh, is market structure that you know? There's a few people that claim that uh, you know not only markup, markup exists, but markup may have picked up uh, in recent uh, uh, years, uh, and then maybe markup uh, is especially high for uh, superstar uh, right. uh, companies. So, uh, you know, how would that affect, for example, the estimated effect of the quantitative digital capital right. uh, in this well, picture, and how would it affect the productivity, Jacob? That's one question, but go ahead. And I, I ask the sure. I mean, I, I think that this is a, a partial explanation, maybe the main explanation for why we're seeing these uh, superstar firms. People have talked, like people like David Otter and, and Christina Patterson have noted that uh, we've had uh, the rise of some bigger firms, more concentration, um, and uh, they just treat it as sort of this exogenous thing that happened. Um, but our data suggests that it, it particularly is associated with the investments in these intangible capital that, that um, and you know, this would be future work, but I think we've got a hint here that uh, IT is a driver behind the growth of these superstar firms. And one of the reasons we're having you know, less of, a, of an even competitive equilibrium and more of a, of a concentration is because IT, for some reason, um, seems to benefit certain firms more than others, or maybe some firms are smarter about using it. Or as somebody mentioned earlier, um, you know, you may have some kind of economies of scale in the creation of digital capital. Any of those things would lead to this, this growing concentration. But for whatever the reason, we are, we are clearly seeing um, that it's, uh, it's very, very skewed, that digital capital is, is very uneven and, and the economy is becoming less, um, you know, more concentrated and with fewer superstars that getting a bigger share of the overall output. It's true. At the same time, wouldn't that also, you know, would lead to a different kind of adjustment equation and also the productivity decomposition, potentially uh, that equation will be affected by uh, existence of... Uh, and well, in, in an extreme case, yeah. I mean, if, if you no longer had competitive markets, yeah, then you, you'd start getting, uh, you'd start getting some monopoly, um, estimates in there. And I have to think a little bit harder about how we would change some of the equations to uh, account for the excess returns. But, um, but yeah, at, at this point, the equation still assume that there's a, there's a kind of a market for right. capital. Okay. So that, this is to be worked out. So I was thinking yeah. whether you have a quick answer. To that. The other question is about the uh, globalization. The, you know, many companies are multinational firms, and this includes many right. digital superstars and multinational firms may high, um, IT, what you call IP, IT capital, IT personnel in ways that may not be in the data. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe some of them will be in the data, but some of them may not be uh, mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the data. To the extent that uh, um, globalization has been increasing, more and more uh, firms, US firm uh, have uh, overseas subsidiaries and moving R&D to overseas uh, uh, sites. Does that lead to over or underestimate the contribution of uh, intangible capital to productivity growth here? I have to think about it. I don't think it changes it fundamentally. Um, I don't know that it, it changes it. it. I think it would just be proportional. I, I don't think that it... No, but if it's yeah, safe, I mean, we, we could just have the market growing. I, you know, I think it would lead to higher. You know, as, as the market grows, of course, ever, all the numbers get bigger, but I don't know that it disproportionately affects intangibles versus other kinds of assets. I think 
My first approximation, I probably have to think about this harder, but my first approximation is it just affect all assets evenly. I mean, to the extent PPE may be still well accounted for, but I was wondering whether the intangibles may have a, sort of disproportionately get underestimated uh, in, in the data. Because PPE, you always- Well, maybe, I mean, you could, you could, I mean, I guess my, my null hypothesis is that, you know, globalization just affects all the assets evenly. I guess certainly if, 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 if intangibles are more important for globalization or globalization affects intangibles differently than other assets, yeah, then it would have a, a differential effect. Um, I'd have to think harder what the story would be, why intangibles would be more affected by globalization versus other assets. But, um, you know, certainly if you, if you told the story of uh, that for some reason, you know, intangibles made it easier to go international, um, that would be true. I mean, I guess you could also perhaps tell another story that, that intangibles are, you know, they're, they're harder to, to transact and, and manage. Maybe they're, they're more uh, specific to particular markets and maybe they're less subject to internationalization. I, I don't have a strong prior about intangibles and globalization one way or the other though. M maybe you do. Um, I would like to make some comment. Go ahead, Long. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to show like my my case of how I understand what's going on here, that your story here. So basically, I think uh, firstly I, I, I like the, the the paper, and I think you're trying to capture the something we know here. That is the this high valuation of some. Uh, tech firms or some you call the superstar firms. So, uh, so I think the the nice idea here is that you are you are showing you have some measure of uh, IT capital, uh, and you show that there's much bigger multiplier that is related to this. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is moving ahead. Help us to decompose the the high valuation of those firms into this part. That's my understanding of this. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's I think that's that's cool. Now, uh, I think, so that's a nice part of this. It's better than the current uh, status uh, queue. But I think the problem here is that uh, uh, it's not really, the logic is still kind of very kind of loose. So we, in a sense, it's like the uh, solar residual, another way of to understand, it's like a measure of ignorance, but I think it's better than before. But it's because we don't exactly know what's going on. Now, I also like your, your emphasize on the adjustment cost, but the, 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 the key here is to show it. And I think we can, to some extent, show it. The, the point here is that we are way beyond the bubble period in the early 2000. Mm -hmm. Actually, many firms have survived and they have shown that the, the kind of the the IT capital can be converted into revenues, profits, and uh, a lot of things. So there's a, there's a group of firms that have done that. So I think uh, you, firstly, I, I would like to see how this is, you decompose the things into the revenues, profits, this or that, how they are related. And also I think there's, you have a long period, you should be able to show so, so what, what, what's your superstar firms? What are they? And why, and basic, and you also emphasize that they are not the, the big fan, the, the, those several ones, mm -hmm. there's this percentage of them. So what are they? How, mm -hmm. why are they successful? And if they are successful, uh, does that show up? How does that show up in their uh, fundamentals? Mm -hmm. uh, it shouldn't be just valuation. So that's the things, at least we should, look into right. this right. yeah uh, so yeah. i think that so that is the part i think there's uh i like the progress but i think that it's it's not really still a lot story yet it's kind of hand waving stage you we can you do better by looking at the, the the parts i'm talking about and you have a time series and i'm pretty sure because we can see that you see even the, a lot of um, tech firms they do make money they do have revenues, the, the, and uh, so the the so they have yeah. converted the, the pot. So we can right. show this trajectory. So that helps the world to understand this better. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, I would like to give us uh, from my real reality sense of what's going on because I I constantly talk to a lot of firms. So the hardest 
the hardest part of this whole digitization is actually how to uh, how to make this uh, digital technology or this the intang intangible capital to be a driver of your of your business. Now, so there are two parts of this. One part, and so the I think the the strength of the information revolution is the it's a scalability part. So basically, we know the the digital revolution is to make the decompose the information into the those zero one so, so make it really into these its atoms, its its the uh, uh, it, it, its bits. Then you can make it very scalable because it's intangible. It's because of the uh, non rivalry feature of the information. So that is. So the, the key part is to make your business, decompose your business, to make the parts that can be scalable, to make it digitized and make it scalable. And that is easier when your whole uh, chunk, a large chunk of your business is very information-based. It's like the, the retail, like the, 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 the community stuff, the, the information-driven uh, business, that is easier. But now when you convert, Combine that with your the real part of your business. Uh, that's it's the management, the production is with that. You need to right. do the same kind of decomposition and 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 combine them. And that is very hard. I've seen a lot of companies. They uh, so it's really about it's not about how much money you spend. It's really how about you integrate into decompose your, your business and make that uh, to to decompose the part to make the part that becomes more scalable standardized, scalable, to come uh, to merge that with your production or the management process. That is the thing I've, I've seen going on a lot, of, in a lot of the firms. So I think the, we kind of know what's going on. It's the, it's the, the keys to show it. But, uh, but I'm, I'm trying, trying to see what my understanding, but at least, but anyway, so, but my suggestion is the, in the first part, at least you can do is to, uh, you should be able to have the, some data show the story. It's not just the kind of the uh, kind of hypothesis part. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think that there's a, that's excellent uh, advice. I, I like the analogy to the, to the solar residual, and now we are beginning to to be more precise where this is coming from in terms of relating it to IT and why there is the excess valuation. As you uh, as you noted, it's not just the uh, the big tech firms. It's the users of this. So you, if you take the big tech firms out, it's exactly what you're saying, that, that having these IT, converting it into value is being right. done by the users of them. And in, in the production function equations, we see that the digital capital doesn't just show up as additional market value that the investors are value. It also shows up in additional measured output, additional revenues, additional actual production coming out of the firm. So we're beginning to see that, that these intangibles, even though we can't see and touch them, um, the investors recognize them, the production function recognizes them, and we have uh, now tools for identifying their magnitude and, and where they're showing up. It is indeed an increasingly uh, concentrated subset of, of user firms in the economy. Let me add my uh, last sentence. I. I it's not just because, as you mentioned, it's not just about those super, super firms. It's really a chunk of the firms. And from my understanding, is that those are the firms that have successfully captured the, uh, the went through the adjustment. They, they, they can't get the know-how right. how, of how to integrate the, the, right. the, that, the digital technology into their uh, intangible capital and make a driver of the business. So that is the part. And my prediction is that this portion of the firm will increase more and more. And that is a good uh, 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 sign of the digitization of the whole economy. And it's coming and because more and more are learning how to do this. But I in, hope so. In the beginning. You know, I, I hope so. I, I mean, I was a little surprised to see that, at least in the United States, we're still in the phase where it's the, the leading firms are pulling away. We're not seeing the average firm catching up to the frontier. The frontier is getting further away from the median firm. Maybe in the next five or 10 years, we'll see more of a convergence. And maybe in China, it's, it's different. I don't know. But the data well, show it, that the United is, States is a more of a gap over time. Yeah, but that's my point. It, it's coming because it's not just several superstar firms. It's a percentage, the top 10%, right? It's, right. it's a chunk. 
And as we can, I think more and more coming. That's at least what I'm witnessing in China. A lot of the unicorns are coming up. And they really learned how to how to do this.、Uh, mm-hmm. So I think it's the. And another thing is that I think for the another angle. Now it reminds me that is to look at the firms that do not have the current, the burden of the current business model, and I think they're just faster. Yes, that's another good point. I mean, I didn't show you the data, but entrance and exits, you know, you show it even more of a, an effect than you show. I, I, the main chart I showed you was a balanced panel, which included firms that were thirty years old. Right,、um, right. So those are very sort of stable companies. It's the new companies where you see the biggest changes、uh, over time, and it, as, exactly. as exactly as you say, it's a lot easier to change your business models to, or to, to adopt business models to IT if they're fresh, and if you don't have to change what you were doing before. So、uh, I think a lot of it's happening from this entrance and exits rather than the continuing firms transforming、right. themselves. So it's those contracts that kind of reveal more secret of what's going on here.、Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I hope somebody will do the similar thing in China. I'd be happy to、uh, coordinate with anybody who, if you can gather analogous kinds of data, and we can see how things change. And I think we should also test your、uh, hypothesis, Long, about whether in the most recent years, whether there's been more of a catch up or whether it continues to to spread out for some period. Sure. Let's let's keep on talking. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure to have a chance to share some of this research with you, and I, I welcome your questions and comments. And、uh, as I mentioned,、uh, they're all available on my website if you want to read more about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Terrific. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Eric.